Um, my question was, how do we build cultural competence? And Michelle talked about bring, bringing in speakers, and certainly that's that's one way of the continuum, right? Um, to raise awareness. That's what speakers tend to do, raise awareness, um, but not so much as the implementation. That comes from a different level. Um, and so that's what something Shelly and I are, are going to be working on in terms of um, how do we reduce racial disparities in the criminal justice system? So one, we have to raise awareness that it's happening and then talk about the reasons why it's happening in different places of the system. And then what are we going to do about it? Right? And that's a, a harder conversation past awareness. So, um, and we're um, um, coming to a close now. Cultural responsivity skills. So, one we have up here is personal awareness of one's own culture and values, which is why I took you all through this kind of race and then culture to crystallize your own culture, cultures, right? Make them visible to yourself, be conscious of them, because you're communicating them all of the time. The next is respect for other cultures and values, and of course we all know we should respect other cultures and values. I think what we're less conscious of is how we um, tend not to, we do things unconsciously that are actually disrespectful of other people, right? Um, so tell me your name? Rob. Robin, when Robin was talking about the root comment in the store um, around baldness, and you were like, or, or calling you a, a man, right? And and you were associating, he was associating not having hair with being male, um, was a, was disrespectful, right? Um, in terms of yeah. not, it wasn't a nice thing to say, right? So, and, but his intention may not have been to be disrespectful. And so oftentimes how we have cultural collisions are through not being intentional about how we're saying things and how we're phrasing and how we're interacting with people. Um, next is knowledge of a specific culture. Um, so I am um, very knowledgeable, culturally proficient in my family's Mexican culture. I'm not proficient in someone else's culture who's coming from Mexico, um, since I am third generation, right? So there's different levels. So getting to know someone's specific culture, one of the things that my husband talks about um, when he talks about Native American issues <clears throat> is how important it is to be tribally specific. You listen for how people identify. If they don't call themselves Native American, you don't call themselves Native American. They might identify as American Indian, or they might say um, Hopi, right, um, or Lakota, or whatever it may be. And then that's that. When if you are then referencing them, um, where it's applicable, that's part of it. Well, it was um, your and where is your family from? Okay, Pine Ridge. And what were the resources like in Pine Ridge? Pine Ridge, right? We're reflecting back what we're hearing and also validating their cultural, their cultural place of where they came from. Awareness of ways in which personal bias, implicit or explicit, may affect interactions with others. So we've talked about that today. Knowledge of institutional barriers that prevent some cultural groups from accessing justice or your services. So we're not going to go through this today, but a question that I would um, kind of for you all to think about through your work is what barriers do we have in our services that are making it harder for cultural groups community to access are we making it harder or easier for people to get services from us <clears throat> next is flexibility and ability to adapt to differences um, and um, you know, the most successful people in life, if you look at them, tend to be the, the ones who handle transitions well. So, and those are flexible people, right? They don't look at a change as, oh my gosh, you know, everything goes out the window now. But, okay, how can we make this work? All right, there's pros and cons. How do we work through the cons? And amplify the pros. Ability to communicate and mediate effectively across cultural differences. 
And part of this, I also train on ethical communication. And essentially that is, how do we resolve conflict effectively, timely, and respectfully um, so that they don't get into larger things, right? So and a lot of that has to do with ability to communicate effectively and also to mediate in the sense that we don't become um, um, uh, allies to others who have a conflict with somebody else. Um, we're able to look more objectively rather through our own biased lenses. Any questions about any of that? Cultural responsivity skills? This is not rocket science, right? These are all skills that you all know on some level, but to bring them to your consciousness when it's uh, with people of different cultures. And so then why cultural competence? Um, to better understand issues of community trust and to more effectively address <coughs> systemic issues. So um, this is, I'm gonna end here. This is actually um, a day long training. Um, the next unit is on implicit um, bias, social cognitions. Again, the curriculum is online through the ABA, Building Community Trust. Um, and uh, would encourage you all to kind of think about, you know, again, how does culture impact our work, how do I need to improve cultural competence and in which areas, and who can help us do this. Um, so bringing in certain experts where they've, they've done this, they've implemented this, um, and looking at particular spe specific policies or practice that you might want to be um, more culturally responsive. Any last questions or thoughts or comments, including from folks on the phone? Okay. All right, well, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it, and see y'all later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.